Thank you all for coming. Uh, so I'm going to confess I did not make this presentation for you, right? Um, what I'm going to show you today is a presentation that I've given at a lot of different professional or organizations. So it actually started two summers ago at um, the Ocala uh, Florida Public Relations Association. Somehow someone got my name and was like, we heard you talk about polarization. Do you want to come and like present to us? And I'm like, so you know, I'm a geek, <laughs> right? Like, yes, I'm PR, but I'm like, and they're like, no, 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 no. And they loved it. And so like someone at that, that saw me present at that was like, hey, can you com come present to my group and then come present to my group and my group? And so I've given some sort of version of this about five or six times now across the US to different PR organizations. Um, so I thought, especially for PhD students, this might be helpful because if you know me, you know I'm, again, like I was not lying when I initially told Ocala I'm a research geek, right? Like I do hardcore quantitative research that tends to have fairly complex statistics. Um, and so how can you talk about that in a way that works for a more lay audience, right? So how can you present what you're doing and saying this is why it matters? Like, yes, I am doing basic science, but I'm doing it in a way that I think you can get something out of it, right? So, so you now are my PR audience, right? So just like harness that for the next like 40-ish minutes as I as I teach you through that. But, but that's what this is and, and, and that's what we're doing. So, there we go. So hello, I'm Maya Hutchins, Associate Professor and Chair of the Public Relations Department at University of Florida. And I am a political comm scholar, right? Uh, so I care a lot about how we communicate about politics and how that influences what we do and sort of who we are. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through some of my research that really focuses on how we understand information. So thinking about what are cognitive biases that we have that are going to influence how we process information and political information in particular. And then why does that matter? How does that influence how we engage with the political system? And then try to leave you with some actual real takeaway tips. So now that you know this, what can you do? How should you think about the, the conversations or media choices that, that you're undertaking? Okay. So to start off, we have to think about how we tend to process information. Um, and I want to stress that these tend to be unconscious processes. Right? So we're not doing this purposefully. Everyone does this. I'm not saying that you're a bad person or not a bad person if you're doing this or you're not doing this. But we have a few uh, biases that tend to occur when we're engaging with communication. Right? So one of my uh, favorite examples of this is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is this idea that when we are presented with information, we tend to interpret it in a way that's going to be beneficial to us, right? That we're sort of looking for the information that already tells us what we think. Uh, I have a picture of Flat Earth here because it's one of my favorite examples of this, right? So Flat Earth Society is a real thing, right? There is a group of individuals that still very much believe that the Earth is flat. Um, a few years ago, someone got the idea that they were going to, to combat this by taking the current president of the Flat Earth Society and his wife on a trip around the globe, right? So the idea being, we're going to put them on this boat, we're going to go around and they're going to see the Earth is round, right? And have this evidence of, yes, this is what occurred. And so, of course, this happened. No, it did not, right? So instead what happened is the president and his wife, after doing this trip, was like, well, yes, you just drove me around the edge, right? You took me around the edge, right? That is confirmation bias, right? That we're presented with this information and we're going to interpret it in a way that already fits what we already think, right? A, a very sort of complementary process to this is motivated reasoning. So motivated reasoning 
is going to be that you are much more critical of information that you disagree with and less critical of information that agrees with you, right? So someone says, Maya, you are a most amazing teacher. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> right? Like, I don't have to process that. I'm not gonna think about it at all. I'm just going to be very uncritical and take that information. Someone critiques me, however, and now I'm going to be like, oh, well, you know, but that student never comes, and like, I saw them texting, so I don't even think they're paying attention and really understanding the depths of my great teaching, right? And so it's this process that, again, we're doing automatically. Both confirmation bias and motivated reasoning are things that we all do, right? It's just inherent to, to what we do. Why do we do this? Right? Why do we have confirmation bias and, and motivated reasoning? These processes tend to exist to try to prevent something called cognitive dissonance. Right? So cognitive dissonance is this state where we're uncomfortable. Right? Uh, as people, we like to be very consistent. We like to have all of the bits of information in our brain matching. Right? And when there's a mismatch between those pieces of information, we feel uncomfortable and we want to do something about it. So I'm going to give you a very real life example of how this happens to me, right? So, two pieces of information about me that are true are I am a foodie and I believe Cheetos are the perfect food, right? This is 100% legit. If you do not know this about me, I am an um, annoying, obsessive foodie, right? I have a third generation sourdough starter. It was originally my grandpa's, then my mom got a piece of it, now I have it. It has traveled with me across the country multiple times. I've had it since I was 18. It still lives and thrives, right? Like, I am that level of foodie. I'm very obsessive. We go to conferences and I tell everyone, I'll see you later at the bar. No, you can't come to dinner with me because I have plans about where I'm going to hit the things that I need to hit in this city. I also believe Cheetos are the most delicious, perfect food that has ever existed. Uh, it's great, I used to teach a big 500 person uh, lecture that was intro to MassCom and I had to talk about cognitive dissonance and I would use this example. And it was great because I usually ended up with gifts of Cheetos at the end of the semester which was <laughs> solid, right? Um, but so these two pieces of information make me uncomfortable, right? These are dissonant. The idea that I have third generation sourdough starter, but I think this super, super highly processed food is like the best creation of food that ever existed it is problematic, right? So this makes me uncomfortable. This is a, these are two cognitions that are now at, at war with each other. And so I can engage in different processes, though, that are now going to make me feel better about this, right? Biology is hard to override, right? Uh, there is a book that is, was like fat, salt, sugar, something like that, right, that looked at the food science of these highly processed foods. And in that book, it actually acknowledges that Cheeto is the perfect food, that there's something about the, the crunch and the salt and the fat content that actually is supposed to ping like all of the, the centers of our, our brain. So I am just like, you know, I'm a, I believe in science, right? I'm a scientist, so I'm like, yeah, the food scientist figured it out. There's really nothing I can do, I'm sort of weak. The other way I can think about this is Cheetos or cheese. And you know, cheese is a gourmet thing. I, I get a cheese box every month. You know, it's from Ver Vermont, not from Cheetos. Right, but, but geez, this is a perfectly normal thing, right? And so what I've done now is I've engaged in motivated reasoning and I've engaged in confirmation bias and I've done these things, so now I have a balance of cognitions that are more positive to this, right? So I've changed the balance and now I'm okay with this, right? Now I don't care because it's like, yep, I, I can be at peace with the idea of I am a foodie, but I also think Cheetos are the perfect thing to eat, right? So, you know, I made a funny example about food because, again, I, I do love food. But this happens in our political lives, too, right? This happens all the time, where we have these pieces of information that are inconsistent, 
and we have to, to deal with this. One problem that we're facing in American democracy right now is this idea of, of polarization, that we're seeing that as a potential outcome or, or consequence of these biased processes that we have um, approaching information. But so polarization, you know, it's this big idea where it's like, you just know it's sort of bad and different, but I'm actually gonna break it down a little bit further, right? So there's a few ways that we can think about polarization. The first of these is attitude or issue polarization. So attitude or issue polarization um, is the idea that we've become more different on our attitudes or, or beliefs about various issues, right? Um, and so there's these beliefs that we've asked in surveys that have um, get done of a representative sample of Americans, and they happen every two to four years. Um, and you know, looking at things like immigration beliefs, abortion beliefs, uh, and, and we don't actually see this happening, right? Um, like, yes, people change their views on attitude and immigration, but these atti but attitude and issue polarization isn't actually growing. Uh, what we're seeing more or less when we're looking at attitudes and issues polarization is we're seeing something called partisan sorting which is the idea being that people know the correct partisan answer to give now. That these issues that didn't used to be so partisan tied now have a correct partisan answer. Um, and so things like uh, reg or Romney Republicans in Massachusetts or Dixiecrats down here in Florida, those don't really exist anymore, right? So for the most part, that's sorted, and that can account for any differences that we would see in these views, right? Not 100%, but most of what we see with attitude and issue polarization is actually that. It's a, an indicator of partisan sorting, but not actually that as a country we've gotten more extreme. The percentages of people who hold those views are relatively similar, or we'll see sort of like shy, small shifts over time, but not polarization. The polarization that I'm focused on, and the one that I actually am concerned about from a democratic perspective, is effective polarization. And so what effective polarization is, is essentially how much you dislike the other side, right? And so it's this growing gap between how much I like my side and how much I like the, the other side. Uh, this is the most sad graph that I think exists in uh, politics right now, right? So uh, the American National Election Study is a study that's being done. It's that random representative survey that happens every year around uh, presidential elections and midterm elections as well. Since 1964, they've had these feeling thermometers as part of their survey that they do every time. And so what that is, is it asks you to report how warm or cold you feel towards uh, a variety of groups, right? So 100 would be, I love them so much, I am very, very warm, where zero is, I am very, very cold, right? So what we're seeing up here at the top is how much Democrats and Republicans are reporting their feelings towards their own party. So I'm looking at Democrats reporting on Democrats, Republicans reporting on Republicans. And so you can see from 1964 to, to 2020, the last time the survey was done, we'll see next fall if it's any different. I don't think it will be, right? Um, but you see that it stayed more or less the same, right? Like Democrats and Republicans like their own party 70-ish, right? Um, so we don't think they're perfect, but we don't think they're, they're awful, right? When we first started doing this in 64, our rating for the other side, so this is now what Democrats think about Republicans and what Republicans think about Democrats, were around 50, right? So again, less than my party. I, I like my side more than the other side, but I don't think that they're horrible and evil. We've seen this change over time. The 2020 numbers are 19 and 17, are average ratings for the other parties, right? This is a problem, 
this, this is a clear demonstrated problem of increases in effective polarization, where we're saying, you know, we're not changing our feelings about our own party. That's not where the change is happening. Where the change is happening is increases in animosity towards others. And in a democracy, that's going to create some problems, right? Uh, because if, if I was in charge of the world, I would do all sorts of things. And you know what? Only one person would be happy, me, right? Uh, politics requires compromise, and it requires us to be able to do things together. And so as we're seeing these increases in effective polarization, a lot of that can then be associated with these larger problems that we have in a country, right? So you all know I'm a communication scholar. So I focus on how communication contributes to this problem, right? What is the role of how we communicate, and how does that influence effective polarization? Uh, when we're talking about communication's role, what we tend to focus on most is this idea that it doesn't happen, right? So when we talk about the problem with communication and effective polarization, a lot of times what we're talking about is either filter bubbles or echo chambers, which are uh, the same process but with different reasons behind it, right? But so it's this idea that we're getting more information from people who are just like us and we're not getting information from others, right? Um, so filter bubbles would be if it happens via an algorithm, right? So we all know that social media watches you, right? Sees what you're spending time on and then gives you more of what you're watching, right? So if you're only interacting or you're only hanging out with people who are like you, then over time it's going to give you more of that, right? And so that would be the, the algorithm creating this filter bubble for you. Echo chamber is going to be if you're doing it yourself, right? That you're only seeking out information from sources who are like you. You're blocking, you're defriending, you're muting, all of these things um, for people who are different from yourself, right? This all sounds like a really bad thing, right? It sounds like a problem. I'm gonna tell you, it's not real, right? Filter bubbles and echo chambers exist, but not to the extent that if you watch the Netflix social network would like you to believe, right? Um, that this happens for extreme partisans, but even with extreme partisans, only about 25% of people are really taking the time to defriend and mute and that sort of thing in, in social networks, right? Um, think about the last time you scrolled social media and you stopped and hate stared at a piece of information that you disagreed with. Guess what, the algorithm picks that up too, right? And so this filter bubble of the algorithm only set giving you what you like isn't there, right? And so this exists, but maybe not to the extent that we're often concerned about, right? So what I care about a lot is how much of that counter-attitudinal information we actually encounter, right? So how much are we interacting with people who are different from ourselves? And how much do we get this? We get it some, right? 100%. Uh, a preference for like-minded information is real. We all do it, right? The, your default choice of where you're going for your news information is generally gonna be, your first stop is the place that you like the best, right? The place that, that reinforces what you already think. We know even in places where you live, this idea of birds of a feather flock together, right? That is a real thing. So this uh, preference for homophily is a real thing that does exist. Selective exposure is a real thing, but it's not perfect, right? We do have experience and exposure to counter attitudinal information, um, and that is good, right? Most of the time, so this is, I have been studying exposure to counter attitudinal information since I was a PhD student, right? So I have been doing this now for over 15 years. I've spent time doing this. I do many research studies every year, and one of the things that I always ask is how much uh, you're talking to people who are different from yourself, right? And so over more than a decade of research on this, consistently I'm getting only about 10% of people 
saying that they never talk about politics with someone who is different from them, right? And this is in my own data that I'm collecting myself or in big public, publicly available data sets. So we have access to some information that's different from ourselves, right? Maybe it's the crazy uncle at Thanksgiving that you don't really talk to, right? But the idea being that you have somebody in your network that you know and you're engaging with is very much a, a real thing. The biggest sort of difference where we tend to see exposure to, to counter out of attitudinal information is through what we would call junkies versus avoiders, right? So if you're somebody who loves to turn on MSNBC or Fox News, it's also very, very likely that you also turn on Fox News or MSNBC, right? So that's this idea of the news junkies, right? So a lot of people consume a lot of media, right? And you have your preference and you have where you're going to most often, but there is a really strong relationship between, between using one partisan news source and using other partisan news sources, right? And so that's what we're seeing more, is there's people who consume a lot, and then there's people who want to consume none of it, right? Um, and so this is where they're using their algorithm algorithms or different things to not get any political information at all. And that's, that tends to be what we're seeing, right? But so I care about counter-attitudinal information. I am a believer, I am a deliberative democratic theorist, right? I, I go to John Stuart Mill that I believe that the best ideas rise when all views are, are shared and we have access to all of those views. So I want to see how do we have exposure to those counter-attitudinal views? How can we get access to it what does it look like? We know that it's more common for us to get that through mediated sources because it's, it's easier, it's more comfortable for us to, to do that, right? Because then I don't have to deal with that uncle that I don't like who's sitting right in front of me at Thanksgiving, but instead I can sort of like pre-prepare, right? So, filter bubbles are real, echo chambers are real, but probably not to the extent that some popular media would, would lead you to believe. And so we know we have counter-attitudinal information, but we also very much know that polarization is a real thing, right? So what's the relationship here, right? How do those two things work together? And so this is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and working on with different colleagues to try to understand what is this relationship, right? And so to, in order to understand what this relationship is, I have to do something called a reinforcing spirals model, right? Again, I warned you all I'm a geek, so we're gonna geek out just a, a little bit. Um, but so what a reinforcing spirals model is going to do is it requires that I have data over time, at least three time points. And what I can do then is I can look at what is the, the information source that people are using, what's their interpersonal and their uh, news use, and then I can look at their attitude. So in this case, what I'm really interested in is effective polarization, and then I can look at that over time, and I can see if one of three different things is occurring, right? So I can see, is there a polarization spiral? Am I actually seeing an increase in polarization because of people's media or communication choices, right? So is media at earlier time points actually changing, increasing their polarization? Or I could see depolarization, and so that would be where media, hopefully through that counter-attitudinal exposure, is actually decreasing polarization, right? Because you realize that it's not a crazy person, but instead it's your uncle, and you actually do like him, and he has reasonable thoughts most of the time, right? And so that would lead to a decrease in polarization or homeostasis, where I can say that really this is sort of, it is what it is, and they're just, they're happening together, um, and they're related to each other, but we actually can't say one thing is, is driving or one or another, right? Um, so with some colleagues, I've looked at this over two different election cycles, right? And I've looked at it both through our interpersonal choices that we're making and also through our media choices that we're making, right? And so what do I see? So first I'm going to talk with our interpersonal relationships. And so what I'm looking at here is uh, what's the ratio in my network of talking to people who are like myself versus not like myself, right? We know 
every, just about everyone's. You're, you're a weird one if you have more uh, dissonant relationships in your life than similar, right? So most of us are gonna have a majority of people are like us, but some that are different. But what's that ratio and does it change over time? And then looking at effective polarization, right? And so what I see, so over a course of an election, so asking earlier in the election, right prior to voting, and then following up after the election, again, over two different cycles, um, we see that polarization decreases through, throughout, right? That there's an increase that as the election occurs, we dislike the other a little bit more. And we see that over the election, our uh, increase in discussion to people who are like ourselves also increases over time, right? But what about the relationships between them? Right? What happens there? What we actually see uh, happening is people who are more polarized at the start of the election campaign are more likely to increase talking to people who are like themselves and in turn, spending more time talking to people who are like yourselves increases your polarization. Right? So what we're seeing here is that there is an increase in polarization over time through our interpersonal networks, right? And so people are like, what? Okay, next time you talk to someone who's like yourself, think about how you're talking to them, right? Think about what is the nature of that conversation. How are you characterizing the other side in that conversation, right? And if you pause and catch yourself and think about that, you might not be so surprised that this relationship is, is what we're seeing, right? So we are seeing, um, but it's starting with those who are more polarized, right? What happens when we look at it through our social media accounts, right? Um, and this is where I have to pause and say I'm not paid by Facebook. I've actually never gotten a Facebook grant. I applied one time and was denied. Um, so like, I'm gonna sound like a Facebook shill here for a minute, but I promise I am not mo monetarily motivated by, by Facebook. Um, so Facebook is still, and why I use uh, Facebook here is because it's still the biggest player in the game, right? Uh, it still has the largest share. We all know millennials and Gen Zs use it a little bit different than Gen, Gen Xers and Boomers, but it, it still has the, the biggest market share, especially in the two elections I was looking at here. Um, so what we see at first, right, when we're just looking at the relationships uh, without looking at the relationships between the two, same pattern that we saw with our interpersonal relationships, right? That we see, we still see that increase in polarization over time, and we see that Facebook news use, right? So just not uh, looking particularly at source, but just are you using Facebook for news? That also increased over the course of the election, that I'm more likely to use Facebook over time. The relationships between them are a little bit different though than what we saw with interpersonal, right? Increased Facebook use at the beginning of the election was unrelated to increased polarization, and that polarization at time two was unrelated to increased Facebook use at the, the end of the election. So we aren't seeing that increase there. Instead, what we're seeing is actually a decrease. We're actually seeing a, pol a decrease in polarization over time via Facebook. Um, so instead what we see is individuals who are mo more polarized at the beginning of the campaign were less likely to increase their Facebook use and that consequently led to a decrease in polarization over time, right? Um, note that doesn't mean that I think you should go get on Facebook if you're not because when we look at differences just between people who are on social media and not, People who are on social media are more polarized than people who are not. But we're not seeing it as Facebook's fault, right? If anything, the evidence is telling us that social media use is actually decreasing polarization over time. And you say, Maya, how can that be? Well, it can be because of counter attitudinal information, right? that you're being exposed to information that is not consistent with what you think, right? So using Facebook at uh, wave one, 
was unrelated to an increase in using attitudinally consistent information at wave two, consequently unrelated to effective polarization at wave three. But what we did see was if you were using Facebook more at wave one, that increased your exposure to counter attitudinal information, right? So you're seeing more information from people who are not like you, right? And that, in turn, being exposed to that counter-attitudinal information decreases your effective polarization later in the cycle, right? So what do, what do I think that, that all, all means, right? First and foremost, Facebook doesn't appear to be facilitating filter bubbles. So this idea that the Facebook algorithm is only going to give you information that you want to see, no, right? We're seeing it actually increases exposure to counter attitudinal views over time. Um, and if anything, when you look at it over time, again, over time, cross-sectionally, Facebook, attitudinal polarization, strong positive relationship, right? But over time, we see that it's actually associated with depolarization because of exposure to that counter attitudinal news sources, right? But so we're left was sort of this conundrum, right? Well, talking to people like me makes me more polarized. Being on Facebook doesn't make me more polarized. It makes me less polarized. But what happens if we're talking to people online, right? So, you know, one of the things we think about is like online discussions. It's the new public sphere. It's the way to democratize everything. And then if you've ever spent time online, you realize that the comment sections are a horrible, horrible place to live, right? So what does that mean, right? How can we take this and how can we think about how we can apply that to a larger sort of context of um, discussions, right? So when we're moving to thinking about online, there's a couple of things that are really important that I want us to, to think about when we're thinking about online discussions. So, the first of these is group identification. So group identification um, is this idea that we prefer people in our in-group to people in our out-group, right? We, this is very, very consistent. Um, we see this, we can make groups out of nothing, right? Like if I tell you, you like this painting and all of these other people also like this painting and this group of people didn't like this painting. You're now going to be meaner to the people who didn't like the painting than you are going to be to the people who like the painting, right? So these fake things. Um, but it happens all the time, right? We uh, are going to attribute sort of good characteristics to our own group and we're going to attribute bad characteristics to the out group. Classic, classic example of this. You're standing in line going to the orange and blue game yesterday. Right? You get bumped from behind. You stop, you turn around, and you look, and it's somebody wearing a Florida State t-shirt. Instantly, that person is bad, right? They're a jerk, they're probably drunk, like why are they even in Gainesville during today, right? We give them all sorts of bad uh, behaviors that we're gonna attribute to that. Same thing happens, we turn around, and it's like, oh, somebody who's wearing the same sorority. Uh, sweater is you, or, or something like that. Or you just see that it's another Gator fan. It's like, oh, well, clearly they got bumped. It was a big, you know, day, right? And we're going to interpret that differently. Online settings are full of group identification markers all the time. It is super, super easy to cue your in-group or your out-group. Have you ever put a frame on your Facebook profile? Have you ever changed your profile picture? to something that was happening because of something that was occurring in the world, right? All of those things are group identification markers. So we can see who's in our in-group and our out-group really easily in an online setting, and we know that we respond to people differently in that setting as well. The other thing that's important in an online setting is this idea of rewards and punishments, right? Uh, so, so modeling is the idea that we're more likely to do behaviors that we see rewarded than punished, right? Um, so the, the, the classic example was, you know, we learned about this with little kids, and we saw a little kid like beating up this doll, and then we told, an adult either told them that was good or it was bad, right? And the little kids who saw the little kid beating up the doll and then told it was good were more likely to do it. 
versus the little kids who saw that and then were told it was bad. We do this all the time, and you're like, come on, how do we reward each other online? Uh, okay, when was the last time you looked at your like count, right, or comments, that you're seeing how many times you're upvoted, right, whether or not you got gold, right, all of this. There are lots of little rewards embedded into online environments. Um, so what we were looking at here was the combination of those two things, right? So what happens if we see someone in our in-group or our out-group being either rewarded or punished for being a jerk online, right? Uh, so using this by creating in-groups or out-groups by uh, using usernames that are associated, that would have cues about party identification, right? And we tested and make sure that they were real. They were real usernames that I scrubbed from the internet and that tested them, right? And then rewarded or punished by upvoting or downvoting the comment, uh, or also having uh, comments that were either supportive or uh, opposing to it. Like, oh, that was great totally gonna reblog you, or dude, that's not what we do here, right? Um, so trying to see, did that matter? Does, so should you all be keyboard warriors and go out there and try to encourage people to not be jerks online so we can have a better democracy? Eh, maybe, right? So what we see with our out group is it doesn't matter, right? So if somebody can identify you as what your group identity is, and you're trying to correct someone who is in your outgroup member, you're trying to correct that Florida State person, it doesn't matter. If other people reward you or punish you, that doesn't actually change their response at all. What I'm looking at here specifically was increases in tolerance, so belief that the, the other side has the same rights that I do and should be able to, to foster, you know, participate in democracy equally. Our in-group mattered though, right? So if I saw somebody in my in-group being rewarded for being a jerk, that decreased my tolerance for the other side, right? So I'm a Democrat, I see a fellow Democrat being a jerk and being told that's great, I'm like, yep, Republicans are awful, right? Versus when I see somebody in my in-group being punished, being told, hey, that's not okay, right? Like I'm downvoting your jerky comment, that increased tolerance, right? That increased sort of perceptions of legitimacy of the other side. And that effect actually translated into their willingness to have discussions with people on the other side in the future, right? So we can see sort of this real democratic effect happening over time, right? So why does this matter? Right? What, what can we sort of learn from this? Uh, my key point is like, what your in-group does matters. If you're out there trying to re police people from the opposite perspective than you, that is not going to do anything. Maybe it'll make yourself feel good, but it does not actually contribute to democracy in a meaningful way. However, your in-group does matter, right? So call out people on your own side when you see them behaving badly, that that's actually something that matters. And it matters for all of the lurkers, which is what most of us are in online settings, that people can see that behavior, see that that's not something that we want to encourage, that we do want to encourage civility, and that can be, be helpful. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't have disagreements, right? That disagreements can have positive effects. When we were disagreeing in a way that was supportive of democracy, that that actually resulted in increases in tolerance and increases in willingness to engage in the political process, which I, I think is good, right? So it's not just that incivility is bad, but it's how we respond to that incivility and who is responding to that incivility is what actually matters, right? So what do I think that you should do as humans in response to this? Right? With all of this information about how we process information and, and what we're looking for, why do I think that actually matters, right? The most important thing that I think you should do is challenge yourself 
to seek out diverse perspectives, right? I'm gonna guess that most of us in this room would fall on the news junkie spectrum of the set of that equation, but really force yourself, right? Think about where you're getting information and make sure that you're getting diverse perspectives. Expose yourself to that counter attitudinal view and think about why they have it, right? Not just to consume it, to laugh at it, but to consume it, to think about, okay, so what is the reason behind that, right? Can I see that view as something that's legitimate and how does that influence what we're doing? Um, please don't be a keyboard warrior unless you're calling out your own side, right? Call out your own side. You see somebody in a group behaving badly and you know that you identify with that person in some way, that's when you can try to, to change behavior. Um, but otherwise, you're just contributing to the awfulness that exists in online spaces. So, you know, maybe not. Um, the most important thing that I think you can do when you're engaging with someone who is different from yourself is remember we are diverse people, right? So I'm talking about group identities, and group identities are really important. Um, political identities are very salient, salient, especially in a news environment. But we always have more than one identity, right? I have an identity as a foodie. I have an identity as a professor. I have an identity as a department chair. I have an identity as a soccer fan, right? All of these different things. And so is there something that you can do to pull that out when you're having a, a conversation with somebody that you disagree with. Uh, true story, one of my favorite things about this. So I was uh, giving this talk down in Sarasota, um, and I know you are all surprised, but I ended up at the bar you know, the night before, <laughs> eating dinner, chatting with the, the people next to me. Again, we're all surprised. Um, so the per woman on my right was a flight attendant, just got off Southwest, it was great, we're chatting. Older gentleman comes and sits behind me, asks me what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, I'm giving a talk tomorrow. And, you know, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a professor that I, I study political communication. Oh, I'm not going to like you. <laughs> I'm like, great. I'm like, yes, this is about just what I'm talking about. Right, so start chatting and, and talking to this guy. Um, I am also a football fan, and I know my stuff. Like, I can talk Gator football, like, legitimately. I know the players. Like, I can do that. I also know enough that I can trash talk FSU, which was his team. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're talking and I'm talking about what I'm doing, but we also get into this in SEC football and, and all of these things. 10 minutes in, puts his arm around me. We need more people like you in the world, right? Because I'm focusing on that shared identity, right? And so still having this conversation about politics on the, the fringe and, and what we're doing, but I'm making him realize, like, okay, I am a, a, a social science college professor, originally from Washington State. Pick your stereotype and I'm gonna fit it, right? And so, but I'm more than that, right? And you can have that conversation with me and realize that I'm more than that and we can go beyond that shared identity into something where it's a shared identity and have those conversations right and i it's how i responded to him too right it wasn't when he was like oh well, i know i'm not gonna like you i could have been like yeah buddy same to you and talk to my new flight attendant friend right but instead i engaged and i showed that i was really willing to listen right there's a big difference between listening to understand and listening to taking your turn to speak, right? Um, and so if you're in this conversation and you're going in knowing that you're right, like, then you're closing yourself off, right? I'm on, I don't believe you're gonna change your opinion, right? I, I don't, the, the research is pretty strong that we're very unlikely to change our opinions, change who we vote for, a few people on the edges, right? And we're divided enough that those few people on the edges make differences in campaigns, right? But for most of us that are pretty strongly held in our beliefs, we're not gonna change those beliefs. I don't want you to change your beliefs. That, that's not what I'm going for. But I do want you to think about that person and understand who that person is and be able to respond to them appropriately. Understand that they believe what they do for a reason and that reason might be just as valid as, as your reason, right? I guarantee you are not talking to Donald Trump or AOC, <laughs> right? Guarantee. 
But this is how we tend to respond, right? The median Democrat and the median Republican are actually much more close to each other on most things than, than we tend to act like. Instead, we act like we're talking to the fringe, and that tends to not be helpful. Right? That tends to increase our effective polarization, which decreases our willingness to compromise, uh, which is not ultimately successful. Right? So, so talk to that person to listen, to, to find where, you're, where you might have common ground. Right? Are you going to change their view? No. But maybe we can increase that effective polarization mark from six, 17 and 19 to like 22, right? and then maybe 25 and right and get to a point where we can compromise um, and that's what I think actually listening to each other and making sure that we're seeking out that counter attitudinal information will will ultimately get us so thank you for that and I'm happy to entertain your questions <laughs>